We've been teaching a lot of students, but to date, a lot have not taken up bladesmithing simply because the, the availability of gas forges has been so limited, and not many people have felt the inclination to build these forges themselves. However, they are relatively simple to do so, if you so wish. Uh, the gas forge, together with the anvil, are the, the two biggest stumbling blocks or the hurdles to overcome for the beginner bladesmith. Right, so follow me and uh, into the workshop and let's get started. Right, this is the style of forge that we have come to call the post box forge. It's a vertical upright forge with two openings, one on either side. This enables you to insert a long piece of steel through the forge and get a localized hot spot where uh, you can heat your steel and, and work on one small section of the steel at a time. It's really unnecessary to have a very deep and long fire and heating up a big piece of steel, long section of steel, uh, yet by the time you get to working that, your steel is getting cold. Right, these are my two well used and beaten up forges that we've been using, obviously on a full time basis in our workshop. There are three of us bladesmiths who, who share all this equipment uh, and uh, this sees a lot of use. So what you see here is obviously not a brand new forge like yours is going to be, but uh, what yours can expect to look like after a probably 18 months of extensive use. Um, yeah, there's a whole lot of flux dribbling out the front, there's some fire scale here, the, the lining is looking a little bit beat up but nonetheless they are still working perfectly. It's about time to have them relined soon so uh, forgive me for the way that these look but I didn't want to give you any false impressions. When you receive your new forge part of the, the kit that you will receive uh, is a handbook uh, on its safe operation. It's imperative that you do go through these notes uh, there's a lot of safety information, some of it might seem boring or even common sense, but bear in mind you are working with a flammable gas, hot surfaces, there's carbon monoxide being generated by these forges, and you are, are dealing with something that is poten potentially quite hazardous, very hazardous in fact. Um, you know, never mind just damaging the job you're working on if you don't follow the instructions properly, you can injure yourself, burn your own workshop down, or even kill yourself. Uh, so it, it, it is very serious that you do need to follow the safety instructions in the handbook, as well as these which we are going to talk about in this video. Firstly, you're going to want to decide where to locate your gas forge. Your, your surfaces of the forge themselves are, are very hot. You've got tons of flame coming out the, the forge, and you need to be aware that all flammable and combustible materials such as wooden workbenches, uh, wooden ceilings, wooden partitions, your waste paper basket, all these kind of flammable things are well clear of your gas forge. When you open your parcel of components for your new forge, you're going to find a number of things. Depending on whether you've bought the, the vertical post box forge, which is generally used for forging of blades and shaping of steel. Uh, otherwise you've purchased the horizontal forge which is a double burner arrangement uh, particularly suited to making Damascus steel. Two burners is going to give you twice as much heat and a longer deeper fire to get a more uh, a bigger hot spot within your forging environment. You're going to find the burner arrangement themselves. Now the design of these burners is of the Venturi type, which means there's no electric blower which forces air through this. What happens here, it operates very much the same, on the same principle as um, a sandblaster or a spray painter's gun. 
where it draws the air from the atmosphere. You've got a tiny little uh, jet on the inside here. You can loosen those little screws. We'll get to all of that later. But you've got there we go. Nice tight fit on this one. Uh, you've got a tiny little jet where you've got high pressure gas shooting out at high velocity down the burner tube and with it it's going to draw air from atmosphere. This burner has a slider which you can move up and down to regulate the amount of air that is drawn into your forge. Now when you get your burner you're going to want to insert the jet through the back just like that to where the tip of the jet lines up exactly with the bottom end of the port opening. All right, does that make sense? So that the bottom end of the jet is lined up with the bottom end of the opening. You're going to lock the jet into its position by tightening these locking screws. And by so, so doing, you can also orientate and aim that nozzle right down the middle and that is important to get the maximum efficiency out of its air that is induced into the forge. So one will tighten those screws down making sure that the way you jack, use these as jacking screws you aim this, the, the jet right down the middle of the tube. Right now that is set to go. At the end of the PVC hose, you're going to find a pressure regulator. What the regulator does is it controls the amount of gas that enters into your burner, or the pressure of the gas, shall I say, it controls the pressure of the gas into the burner. Depending on how you screw this little tap, you're going to notice the pressure change on the gauge. Right now, the most common forging, or shall I say, whether it's most forging will be done at around 100 kPa, one bar. It's not a very high pressure, and for safety, we've designed it just like that. There are some forges that operate up to three bars pressure, but those can tend to be a little bit more dangerous because of the pressures that build up in these hoses. The clamps have to be that much stronger and. Uh, one bar is, is much safer. So general forging is going to be done at around and about 100 kPa as well as Damascus. Now um, there are other procedures in the forging sequence like uh, just general straightening of these blades or the normalizing sequences after you forge your knife where you will want to run at much lower t uh, pressures right down to in the region of maybe 20 or 30 kPa and uh, we will get to that as well. But just bear in mind that your pressure regulator will vary the pressure in this hose and we generally are not working at much more than 100 kPa. You might on occasion feel you need to get that little bit more extra temperature out of your forge and going up to 120, 130 would not be unreasonable. Right, your burner itself gets inserted into the pipe on the gas forge, just like that. There will be a stopper here that stops that from going in too far. These ones on the Damascus forge have just that. That little stopper gets inserted in there until it comes to a stop. There we go. Both of them inserted. Here are your sliders that can move up and down and uh, regulate your airflow. The nozzles, the jets, get jacked into position. One wants to take a little bit of care and time to get them set up in their correct position. And if you tighten up those screws nicely, that needs to be only done once. For safety reasons, we've got our multiple gas bottle manifold set up outside the workshop. And we've got a lovely little hole in the wall, ventilation, where we can put our hose through like that. And it gets connected up to the manifold on the other side. 
In your case, whether it's the post box forge, you, you can screw your regulator directly into a large 48 kilogram uh, gas cylinder. That, that is uh, what is recommended. The, you can use the smaller cylinders like a 19 kg uh, or a 9. Uh, your working time will obviously be much reduced. Uh, firstly, you want your gas bottles to be stored in a tamper-proof cage, something like this, behind lock and key. our regulator with the pressure gauge. One will want to screw that into the bullnose fitting. Remembering that these gas fittings are left hand threads. I've turned the face of this gauge in such a way that I can read the pressure from inside the workshop through the hole in the wall. Now if you don't have a, a manifold set up like this, you're going to be operating your Damascus forge off of the two bottles and there are two bullnose fittings off of these rubber pigtail hoses that will screw into two bottles. The post box forge need not operate off of two bottles simultaneously. It can work off of only one. Now the purpose of either the double cylinder setup or as we've got it here with four is to uh, provide us with the capability of opening all these bottles, now remembering some of them will be fuller than others, that each, bot each cylinder, they're, they're not referred to as bottles, Coke comes in bottles, these cylinders um, each, each have to, are required to only deliver a quarter or a half, in, in, in your case, um, of the volume of gas required. Now, have you ever taken a deodorant can and just squirted on the plunger and felt the chill, the cold that comes onto that cylinder, or that little deodorant can? The same sort of refrigeration effect, as it's called, will happen with these cylinders, where the greater the gas delivery, the colder the cylinder will become. And to a point where the outside of the cylinder is going to uh, have some condensation forming on it and then further receive some icing. Now once your cylinder starts condensing and icing, that's when you are going to have a lower and lower gas pressure uh, in your cylinder and also at the same time your forge will be burning colder and colder and you are not going to get the temperature you require for the forging or the Damascus work that you're doing. It's also important to take note when you purchase your filled cylinder that you choose the bottles that are not dented and, da and damaged. Also this protective ring around the valve should not be damaged because that will protect um, the, the valve in case it were fallen off a truck or, or, or dropped. The cylinders should always be left standing upright. You don't want to ever lie your cylinder down. Uh, it is sometimes spoken about as a practice to lay your cylinder down horizontally when it gets to a low pressure, uh, thereby increasing the evaporative surface of gas and give you a, a extended working time. But this is a dangerous practice because it enables sometimes a liquid to be pumped out of the valve which in turn gets injected into your forge and uh, the rate of expansion of that liquefied gas is such that you suddenly get a very big flame coming out of your forge. By experiment we found that the gas forges will consume on average about 1.6 kilograms of gas per burner. So in other words, your post box forge, which is one burner, will consume 1.6 kilograms of gas per hour and the Damascus forge will burn double that amount per hour. 
So in other words, your post box forge should give you approximately uh, a theoretical 30 hours of work time per cylinder and Damascus approximately 15 hours of work time per cylinder. But that is a theoretical working time because what happens is as your gas pressure, your, your, your fluid level in your cylinder decreases, so does the pressure that you are able to generate from that cylinder. So eventually there comes a time where you've still got just a little bit of uh, fluid in the bottom of your cylinder, but you're not able to get sufficient pressure out of your, out of your cylinder. As far as dealing with fire emergencies, it's not a bad idea to have a garden tap close to your cylinders and also to have a bucket which we use for the dogs drinking water um, just, just for helping to fight fires in the unlikely event of that. And then just around the corner here, we've got our fire extinguisher mounted. So a dry, dry powder is, is a good one. Make sure your, your fire extinguishers are regularly serviced and are up to date. They will get a, a date stamp. And this is also very important for your insurance policy. If by, by accident your workshop burns down, they're going to come and investigate. And if you're found to not have the necessary safety precautions or whether you are a uh, doing unsafe practices, you could render your policy invalid. So just keep that in mind. Prior to lighting your forge, you want to make sure that you have plenty of adequate ventilation. Open your windows, big sliding doors should be open. Uh, we've got a window that has uh, little computer fans in it and those, those blow into the workshop. Right, the first step is to screw your regulator into the cylinder. Just orientate it in such a way that it misses the, the guard. Remember, left hand thread. And it's designed in such a way to be slightly awkward to get your fingers around that you are not tempted to uh, over tighten that screw but obviously it mustn't leak so a firm finger tight is all that's required one needs no spanners on that right one of the most important things to remember is that you light your paper inside your post box forge first and only then do you turn the tap at your cylinder open Remember your safety equipment and gloves, one doesn't want to burn. It's a little bit difficult to strike a match with a glove on the other hand. And safety also dictates that you strike away from yourself. That you don't throw sparks onto your clothing. Once the newspaper is burning good and proper, uh, you can prepare to open the, the tap. Just be sure that your slider is slightly open and don't stand too close to the opening. You see how by moving the slider you can change the way your your flame burns. You're varying the amount of oxygen available uh, to the LPG gas. Now first of all we're going to set the gas pressure at the regulator. Right, we're going to be doing some knife forging soon. So I'm going to want to set this to 100 kPa. So I screw the tap in. You can see the needle move. There we go, 100 kPa. So that gives us a constant gas pressure within the line. Right, so we've just freshly lit this fire and we want to now adjust our slider to the approximate position for forging. There are two positions which we don't want. 
that is almost entirely closed where you land up with a very yellow flame coming out of your forge like that. That is very dangerous. It uh, gives you a lot of carbon monoxide in your workshop and you're burning a lot of gas but not generating much heat at all. The other option which is uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum is where we open the slider entirely. Now you've got a flame that burns like a rocket engine. It's very oxygen rich and when you work in that fire you're going to land up with an exceedingly unnecessary amount, large amount of fire scale building up on your steel. So we want a nice compromise between an oxidizing and a reducing flame. So we are going to close the air just a little bit. Something like that should work just fine. One will need to adjust your slider once again once the forge is up to temperature because the, the burning environment will have changed. It's going to take a couple of minutes for this forge to come up to temperature and uh, let's say about 10 minutes we could be up to a good working temperature. I've used the castable refractory inside these forges as opposed to the ceramic fiber wool and the reason I've chosen that is that the castable is much more durable, it takes a little bit longer to come up to temperature but once it is at temperature it itself becomes a radiating heat source and is more economical in its gas consumption. Now if by accident your forge didn't light on its first attempt, make sure you switch the gas off straight away, allow your forge a, a, a moment or two, you know, let's say half a minute to, to vent itself and let the unburned gas that's surrounding your forge uh, dissipate, blow away and only then do you light your forge again. Unburned gas in your workshop is particularly dangerous. Gas is heavier than air. It can sink into submerged drains and uh, basements. One, one wants to make sure that your forge is lit all the time. And it's also important that you never leave your workshop with your forge burning in case something were to go wrong, that you need to be on hand to be able to take the necessary steps to prevent an accident. If you turn your forge really low, there is also an increased possibility of the fire snuffing itself out. One needs to be aware of the smell of unburned gas in your workshop. Sometimes the joints of the hoses may leak, or sometimes you may have by accident touched these hoses with a hot piece of steel that they have a rupture in them. So constantly be aware of the smell of unburned gas. Right, the forge looks up to temperature now. It's a nice bright orange to yellow temperature. Uh, you want to make your final settings on your slider. So if there are any adjustments to be made, just get your flame tuned correctly. It's much the same as a car's carburetor where you've got the petrol to the air ratio that needs to be set.
straightening and touch-ups. It's nothing more than gentle hammering and finishing up. We want to set our forge temperature much, much cooler. So we're going to adjust our regulator. again you're going to need you to leave your fire just you're going to need to leave your fire for a couple of minutes just to cool down because your chamber lining has so soaked up so much, so much temperature So for straightening we're going to use a really low temperature. You don't need the bright yellow temperatures as earlier for forging. This is a dull orange to red color. One needs to be made aware of uh, a phenomenon called grain growth and that is encouraged by high temperatures. That's why it's important to finish up at these much lower temperatures. You can see the difference in the color there. That's straight. Now comes normalizing. Normalizing is a sequence that precedes the hardening, and uh, every successful hardening requires a successful normalizing sequence. You're going to need to study up about this. We will be normalizing three times, each time heating the steel up to a non magnetic temperature. You'll notice we have a speaker magnet against which I can test the temperature of the knife. The steel loses its magnetism the moment it, is, it has reached the correct normalizing temperature. No hotter, just hot enough to render the steel non-magnetic. You'll notice as it cools down, it becomes magnetic once again. Lay it aside, let it cool, and repeat the cycle two more times. Each time making sure you don't overheat the steel, which will then enlarge the grain structure, which is what we're trying to avoid. Normalizing is also a stress relieving sequence that will prevent uh, your blade warping during hardening. Right, the knife has now been normalized three times, and it's now time for the hardening procedure. I have my quench tank here filled with heat treat oil, and we uh, pre-warm our oil. And I'm going to use just a piece of round bar for that. You'll not, you can use your gas forge to heat that piece of steel and just put it into your quenching bath. We're wanting a temperature of the oil in the region of maybe lukewarm bath water. We're not going to be making french fries in there. Right. Warm bar goes into the oil. Move it around just a little bit. And the warm oil is going to prevent thermal shocking of your steel as it gets quenched. Also, warm oil will circulate the heat out of your blade faster. The eddy, cur the eddy currents circulate quicker and quench your blade more effectively. to heat this blade up. Once again remembering that your hardening temperature is exactly the same as it was for normalizing. You're going to heat it up and test it against the magnet and the moment it's no longer sticking to the magnet that is the correct temperature for quenching. Right, 
double check against the magnet. Alright, we're good to go. Make sure your oil is in a safe place in case your oil flashes. That catches, if it catches fire, then it's not going to cause any problems in your workshop. We've done an edge quench here, differential hardening. After hardening, don't forget that this knife still needs tempering in an oven. That can't be done in a gas forge. Once forging is complete and you no longer require your forge, the safe shutdown sequence is as follows. You want to start off by shutting off the tap at the cylinder. Allow the pressure that's within your hose to bleed through and complete, completely burn out within the forge. Once the flame has extinguished itself within the forge chamber itself, extract the burner out of the forge body and lay it down somewhere safe. Be careful that nozzle end is very hot. The forge chamber will also remain hot for quite some time after shutdown, so be careful of touching it too soon. You'll need to do regular inspections on the quality of your materials. Um, you want to make sure the be sure never to use any grease or oil on any of your gas fittings. That causes an explosive reaction with the LPG gas under pressure. The hoses are in good condition. You don't want to have any uh, sections of hoses that are perished and uh, inspect your clamps that your joints don't leak. Check that the threads on your regulator are in good condition, the, the lens on your, your gauge. So before working, you, you need to make sure that your equipment is in good order. Also, from time to time, you'll need to do a gas leak inspection uh, by taking a strong soapy solution and dabbing it with a paintbrush or uh, a, a squirty gun onto all your joints to check for bubbles of gas leaking. If, if you find such problems, you'll need to take corrective measures. Right, we're going to now show you the safe operation of your Damascus forge. The main differences between the Damascus forge and the postbox forge is that the Damascus forge is going to be working at a much, much higher temperature and the heat and the light emitted out of the front here uh, is sufficient to damage your eyes first of all so we recommend the use of a, a pair of special safety glasses this is a brand called Uvex and they will offer you 100% um, protection against both UVA and UVB rays you are also going to be subjected to a lot of pot flux and, and fire scale spatter so you're going to be going to put some long gloves on make sure you wear a protective ap apron as well as long trousers and boots or, or, or closed shoes. You don't want to be making Damascus in shorts and flip-flops. One might decide to choose to rather use a dark face shield as opposed to the dark glasses. That's your choice, but do protect your eyes. We are preparing to light up our gas forge. The first thing you need to do is to ensure that your ball noses, uh, your ball valves at least, are shut. We are then going to open up our cylinders and one need to only open them maybe um, two half turns. That way you can quickly and rapidly shut down in the bottle in the case of an emergency. Once your bottles have been opened, uh, you're going to go inside and uh, light your newspaper and only then will you open up the ball valves. Now in my case I will be opening up these but your main, my main isolation will still be shut. That will be opened only once the newspaper is burning inside the forge chamber. 
Once again, you're going to have inserted your burners into the side of your gas forge. Your jet or your, your nozzle is set at the correct depth and locked into position with the lock screws. Make sure that the jet is aimed nicely down the middle of your burner tube. I have some newspaper, my match is handy, and only once I've lit the newspaper am I going to open my main gas valves, the ball valves, and the way we've got ours positioned here, having to lean through the wall, make sure you are standing well clear of the front of your forge, because very often this ball of newspaper gets blown out, or if you have um, a fire that is slightly delayed in ignition, you could land up with a, a big bang and a ball of fire at your forge opening. So you don't want to be anywhere near there as you open up your gas flow. Wait for it to catch properly. Right, open up the gas. with 50 
again to land up with the flux foaming upwards and it almost begins to look like bullfrog skin. It doesn't have that liquid effect of the frying butter. It's, it's like a dry foam. Set your air on your sliders less and that should be better. Brush off the old flux and put some new flux on. procedure. Once again, same as the post box, we're going to close the taps at the cylinders first of all. Allow the hoses to bleed. That means all the gas under pressure within the system has the opportunity to go through into the forge. And if you were listening, you would hear that the forge now has suddenly died down and it's quiet. We can now close the ball valves. There's no gas in the line, and I switch off my main isolation valve. Right, pull out your burners, and this will allow your forge to cool down nicely. Take a moment just to have a smell, smell for anything that might have accidentally caught fire from the flux that you've been brushing around the workshop, the fire scale that's been bouncing off of the hammer, some of it's been bouncing on my arm. You can dress it with some uh, burn gel. And uh, yeah, we hope that you work safe and that you take the time to make some beautiful knives and we hope to see some of your work in the near future. Thank you. This is a Bowie knife that I've recently completed. Uh, it's a Damascus steel that has been forged to shape. And uh, it's just a typical example of what you can do when you can make your own Damascus and forge it to shape. We try to encourage people to not stock remove their Damascus because Damascus is a precious material and to go and bandsaw and, and hollow grind all your steel away you're creating so much off cut and it's very waste, wasteful so uh, if, where one can try to forge your Damascus as close to shape as you can. If you want to learn more about bladesmithing and forging of knives uh, we ourselves here at Heaven Forge also offer bladesmithing and Damascus courses, so there's no excuse to not knowing where to go from here. Knife making is such a broad field which requires you to be proficient in right from your bladesmithing procedures, metallurgy for heat treatment, 
uh, botany if you want to go and select your handle material, leather work. So there's a lot of material and information to, that you need to uh, learn about and resources will include uh, various books, the internet, uh, forums and so on, uh, websites, certainly your local library or university uh, library which should be able to help you. So there's, there's lots of information out there and with this uh, instructional video having been done we really do hope that this encourages you to continue forging knives, that we get to see a lot more forged blades at our knife shows in the future.